So I'm gonna I'm gonna get started here. Um, hopefully, most of you will um, know a little bit about Nursing Now Challenge, and you may hopefully have joined us on the first of these wonderful webinars um, that we are having with our fantastic colleague Alexandra, who is based at WHO HQ in Geneva, who has kindly given up her time. Um, you may have seen her on LinkedIn. Oh, there's Zippy coming in from Africa. Um, on LinkedIn, um, Alex, you did this fantastic post. Um, I would recommend everybody, please follow Alex on LinkedIn because she does the most amazing posts. And I was telling um, my colleagues about this, about the um, the insight. In fact, it was my son. It wasn't my colleagues. It was my middle son. And he is 16 years old. He's about to be 17. And we were talking about politics in the car. He's very interested in this. And I was telling him about your post, Alex, because you had been in Paris um, in a close meeting with Macron and the DG, and you were reflecting on the importance of political will and how leaders negotiate with each other and discuss with each other. And I think the point for me and to everyone listening here, um, because Nursing Now Challenge is about helping you develop that political awareness and understanding how it works at that level for nurses to understand. And I mean, these posts that you put out there, Alex, I've never seen anything like it before. We've never had that. And you do it so well because you do it with great insight and it's it's so useful and people always comment on them because we've kind of never had that insight and it's not that you're giving away state secrets it is just about how people are communicating and interacting with each other and it was such a wonderful post um where it you just shared your observations from an expertise of somebody who deals in social media um it was fantastic so um really something for you to pick up on. So Nursing Now Challenge obviously is a global network of early career nurses and midwives and students. Um, we are over 61,000 strong across um, nearly 100 countries and almost 1,000 organisations, hospitals and universities. And many of you on the call today have um, supported us in making that happen. Um, the success of the campaign um, and the initiative is really down to you. We are the vehicle um, and the place for you to um, seek out resources and have support, mentorship, encouragement and development opportunities. And we have this wonderful program. Um, it's one of our key programs, the Global Solutions Initiative, which was run when we were nursing now, the global campaign, and has continued. And the Global Solutions Initiative really is about connecting different nurses and midwives from around the world to share ideas and encourage you to be innovative around resolving global health issues. And that's a real key thing, really. How do we come together and do that. And we pick different topics that are topical um, and we interrogate those. So this is an opportunity for us to create a platform for you to share experiences, demonstrate the power of your knowledge through innovation and solutions to global health challenges. So how it works is, and for those of you who have maybe joined us for the first time, I'll just run through it. We have a launch webinar, which we had a few weeks ago. You can watch that again. And then the second webinar is us running this workshop that we're going to do today. And it's an opportunity at the end for you to make a submission of what you think would help be part of the solution to um, the challenges that we face. And the topic this time is disinformation and misinformation, which is absolutely huge. I can't tell you how influential or not this is when we're tackling challenges, global health challenges that are very relevant to us as nurses and practitioners. Remember, we are the largest workforce across the country, in every rural area, city, town, although there is a global shortage, we remain the largest voice as health workers. So therefore it's so important for us to understand, particularly for our new generation, 
for my generation, I'm learning. I've learned so much just listening to Alexandra. Um, and um, we kind of decided this was really something that would be really useful for you to get involved in. So remember at the end of this, um, uh, these sessions that we're doing, it's over to you. You have the power to make the difference and make the change. And the winner, or the winners, the team, will get a chance to pitch their idea um, to Alexandra and a couple of colleagues at the WHO. So that's an amazing opportunity and experience and have your voice heard. And who knows where that may take you. So today, this morning, we're going to hear from Alexandra um, she'll do a quick recap and then there will be a presentation which will really delve a bit more deeper into this misinformation and disinformation. And then we will have um, some a couple of maybe breakout rooms for you to think about this challenge a little bit more. And Alex will fill you in. Don't worry, because at the end of each part that when she's speaking, there'll be a chance for you to an, uh, ask questions okay we're not going to wait till the very end when it's all over we're going to kind of do that as we go along and take you on this wonderful journey um so um i'm so grateful that they've created the time today hopefully you you will enjoy the session and um over to you alexandra and just once again thank you so much on behalf of nursing now challenge and our members for your time i know you're really busy and we really appreciate it thank you so much Oh, sorry, I did. Sorry, I did mean, mean to say one of the examples that we're going to focus on is the pandemic accord, which is another thing you really need to get involved in. Um, we are at a critical point with the pandemic accord. Please look out, find out about it, use your voice. We've had some great posts on social media from early career nurses. We want you to make some small videos and say how much it's important for us, for our health workers post pandemic to never make that happen again, for us not to suffer as health workers for our safety, but also for the people that we care for in populations. Now over to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Aisha. This was a great intro and thank you for all the positive feedback. Um, before I start my presentation, maybe I, I would just like to add to that, that um, my voice and niche on LinkedIn is to communicate from a social media expertise and communication in health as uh, there is no so much conversation about social media in health or how we can use social media for health. Um, and this is a part as well that I will encourage you to, you know, think about who is your audience, who is your, where is your niche that your voice can um, make a difference. And in the example of the pandemic accord um, that brought us together here as well in this exercise, um, as you are in the front line when there is an outbreak and when there is a health emergency, uh, you know firsthand how it is when you don't have enough protection or when you don't have enough understanding and people are not listening enough to you or how it is for your patients. For me, it's harder to communicate. Like I can amplify your voices, but I'm not the person who is in, in a hospital, in a facility. I can more talk about what I've seen, uh, what we've done well or what we didn't do well, how we've communicated in, in the last pandemic as I've been on the front line of the social media response. So, um, Thank you for your time and also to Aisha and Nursing Now Challenge. Uh, yes, there's a lot happening in WHO and the negotiations, et cetera, but this is also one of our priorities to uh, collaborate with partners and share the skills and, and expertise that we've gained in the pandemic with, um, with others. So thank you for the opportunity. And um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Um, do, you, do you see my slides? Perfect. So again, um, this uh, today, in, in comparison to last session, when we more set the scene about misinformation, pandemic accord, and concrete disinformation around the accord, today I'll focus more on really practical tips, do's and don'ts, that can help you improve your social media presence, not only if and when you want to address some mis and disinformation, but also in general, when you when you communicate about health or in 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 general, um, as I know there may be people who haven't joined us last time. Just a quick recap that the key um, 
uh, focus was last time to really understand the difference between misinformation that can be um, an innocent sharing of something that's not factual. You know, we've seen at the beginning of COVID people sharing, you know, eat garlic, that's going to help you prevent infection. And, you know, it may came from a family member sharing it forward to friends or loved ones with the best intention. Um, while disinformation, on the other hand, is um, intentional sharing of a narrative or someone else's agenda, it can be dangerous. Uh, and again, for people who are not um, understanding enough of the subject, they may share it further as, as misinformation. And in any case, information spreads as fast as virus, maybe sometimes even faster. Uh, and if it's exciting, um, it spreads even faster. So we all have a role as individuals to um, help stop the spread of uh, the bad content, but also we can um, work on pre-banking and producing more of a quality content so that people have actually uh, more access to accurate um, information. Ideally as well, this network comes from many parts of the world. So the more you communicate also in your you know, native languages helps um, as international bodies don't have the capacity to communicate in, in, in every language, language. So this is also the power of networks and, and partnerships. Um, last but not least, the pandemic accord, uh, it is a legally binding instrument. Um, member states are in their final negotiations and it's been very tense last two weeks at WHO. The main really objective is to take on the COVID lessons and do better next time, uh, and primarily to address inequities, access to, you know, vaccines and other tools, sharing information, path pathogens and as well to foster trust and closer collaboration among member states, but also other, other stakeholders. Uh, moving into today's um, program, so to say, I would like to start with some basic do's and don'ts on social media. Um, and here is something I found this morning on the internet. Um, content is king and context is queen. And what does that actually mean? I have something here where I was, oh, I can't find it now. Here it is. When I was in one social media conference, it actually crosses the king and says the content is uh, queen, a bit of a gender message here. Um, but um, joke aside, really content is key. Do we have a valuable content for our followers, for our community to share? Are we uh, sharing a new insight, personal insight, or are we just saying something for the sake of saying? And we're seeing a lot of that also. Infodemic is not just, you know, sharing the, the bad noise. It can be just the noise for the sake of the noise, and that also is not necessarily helpful. It may also dilute the, the, the key message. So here are some uh, examples that I wanted to share of good content, just as food for thought. About 10 days ago, I was in Riyadh with Dr. Tedros, and he was speaking very directly on a panel. And one of the messages that he shared is that without help, there is nothing. And basically, speaking about developmental agenda, he was arguing that health should be the number one priority, because when people if we take it as individuals, when we are not healthy, we don't even want to eat, we don't want to get up, we don't need anything, we just want our health back. And, you know, the message is very short, no tags, hashtags, etc. Video is about 30 seconds long, so straight to the point, but something that can resonate to every human being uh, out, of, out of question. Moving into some examples of the pandemic accord, as this is a very complex issue and we've seen a lot of disinformation, it's very hard to package it in a very simple product. But what my talented colleagues who do video editing from one of the speeches earlier this year, uh, they made a quick compilation um, from the speech or like edit from the speech about pandemic accord expl explainer. And we didn't want to go into much of a text who wanted actually people to watch the video and get their message 
uh, from, from there. Of course, producing video content requires some skills, but actually many, especially younger people, you know, live with video content uh, and it's becoming native. And there are also apps that I will mention later that can help you to produce or edit content faster than it used to be. AI technologies are amazing nowadays. There's a lot of good stuff out there, not just the risks. Um, speaking about context, how does these messages resonate in different contexts? So scrolling through Dr. Tedros' messages, thinking like what's the latest or most interesting to share with you, I came across this. Mandela Day, everyone loves Mandela. Everyone is sharing powerful, you know, memorable quotes from Mandela, rightly so. When it was late last Mandela's Day, it was also one of the weeks when the member states were negotiating pandemic accord. So we found a quote that can actually resonate with the context on what's happening at WHO in the moment and using that, and you know, motivating personality, um, well-known globally, as well to share a message of encouragement to member states who have been in our building at the time. Another one I thought is just to show with quite a good engagement. We were in Paris in June last year, meeting organized by President Macron about the new global finance impact. Dr. Tedros met briefly on the corridors with the president of South Africa. I was there, I made a little video instead of a photo of their greeting. And Dr. Tedros also appreciated support for the pandemic accord. So sometimes it's not the main conversation, but it can be just part of the bigger picture where you want actually to add what is the priority uh, for you. Just food for thought for different contexts on how you can uh, add, add your message. And now I want to move into some practicalities of how to uh, make sure your social media posts are clean, how we like to say, and the power of tagging. Tagging is really important because uh, you give a notification to people about your message. You give them a signal that you want them to see it, hopefully also respond, amplify, take further action with it. However, there are nicer ways to do that. Um, and I'll share a few examples. So also when we were in, in Dubai World Government Summit, Dr. Tedros did an interview with CNN Anchor among the other topics that discussed pandemic accord. The main message from DG was that the world is still unprepared for the pandemics and this is why we need the accord. We shared a video of the interview. We tagged the, the anchor and one hashtag of the key topic pandemic accord. I would like you to pay attention here on the number of the blue words in the post, uh, that there's no too many blue words at the bottom. So it is in the sentence and it's a clean post. However, sometimes you want more than one person and or tagging people doesn't really fit into the sentence that you're saying. So there is an option that you can actually tag people in the visual, which is way cleaner and neater. Uh, also doesn't take too much of the characters of the main message. Um, so these are some tricks that still, you can give a signal to those who you want them to see for sure, but without making your tweet um, or message look uh, too complex. Here's an example from this morning. Uh, and if you look at, uh, at the post that uh, was sh shared from the Nursing Now Challenge, we have two hashtags that are key, Pandemic Accord and NNCJSI, tagged main accounts, great. It's also great that Dr. Tedros, Barda Trust, and Professor Aisha are tagged. For example, at WHO, we would put these tags in the visual and rather than having them all at the end of the tweet. So this is a very nice clean tweet with few tweaks, it could have been even nicer. Maybe we are also a little bit um, looking into this because we look at, at all times. So we look into these little details, but it's just as well, you know, when people are engaging, sometimes when they are scrolling and when you see a lot of blue words, then you, kind, you miss the main message and the content. And this is why we are advising as well to um, measure how many of the blue words you're going to have. Moving to LinkedIn, uh, 
one of the posts, it's from last night, it's actually inviting people to join this session. Uh, and I elaborated, what are we doing? Why am I doing this? What I'm gonna focus on? But if you see, there is no blue words at the bottom. And I really wanna warn you when it comes to blue words on LinkedIn, because if you have, because you can often see that people have like plenty of tags at the bottom of the post and LinkedIn realized that. So if those accounts are don't really react with your post where you tag them, you kind of get punished in the algorithm with less engagement and less visibility because it's considered spam. So they want you to tag individuals or pages strategically in your post rather than tagging people to notify them of your post. So think about that next time and maybe you can test it through time how it works. The other thing is, you know, you can also send the link to, of your post to the people you want to see and invite them that way to engage or share your posts rather than having a plenty of people tagged at the bottom. The other option like on X as well is to tag them on the visual. In this case, I've shared a link from the previous session for those who have missed it. So I didn't have a chance to tag more people on the bottom, but I, I made sure to tag some of the key people or key hashtags in the text um, itself. When it comes to Instagram, um, I also want you to, I want to encourage you because you're a network, for those who are using Instagram, maybe to think about collaboration posts. It can also be between nursing now and individuals when there is a very powerful message, powerful video. However, to make the maximum of this, this feature, you really need to plan in advance this type of activities because if you, I mean, sometimes it's emergency, you can't really plan much in advance, um, but to make the most of it so that both sides are planning on the timing, planning on distribution strategy, make an agreement how you're gonna do it when you're gonna do it um, in, in advance. Moving on to the hashtags, everybody loves hashtags and plenty of hashtags, but the truth is that often nobody cares about the hashtags. Hashtags are key search terms and they should be used because yes, they do facilitate how people find your content or how people can find your content. But unless you use a key topic hashtag or unless you have a very um, catchy one for your campaign, adding too many hashtags at the end is not necessarily going to help uh, with engagement. It may actually be the opposite as I said previously, when there are too many blue words and people are scrolling that they miss your main message and find the post um, boring. And think about as well when you are scrolling, and again, we are competing with our friends, travel photos, babies, kids, holidays, you know, Easter, Christmas, or something else. Uh, th this is all, this is majority of people's interest. Um, when they're scrolling on social media. And then we come in with a serious message about pandemic accord. So we really need to think about being as creative as, as more straight to the point. Um, as mentioned, there are different tools to help you with, uh, with your posts. Um, Canva is really a helpful tool to develop visuals, simple visuals with color, uh, icons, you, it's really plenty of options. And even if you don't have a subscription, there, there's actually quite a good base that you can use for free. CapCut is an app where you can um, edit videos. It has an AI feature for automatic uh, captioning, which is very helpful. You need to fix it, but the edits are minor. It's really good. And I mean, within a minute, you get the subtitles for your full video. The other thing that CapCut is good at, you can also record your selfie videos to have the transcript on it to read it because you're looking in your camera and it goes on your screen. So quite a lot of features that can be helpful and through time, if you start using it, you're gonna get better and better. The others that you can use as well for spell check uh, or if you're communicating in a foreign language to make sure your grammar is, is, is correct or typos. You know, we often do many things and type them quickly. So it's really important to make sure your, your uh, messages are, are fully correct. So these are just a few that I'm using, um, but 
there are many, many others for you to make your own toolbox and what fits your, your needs uh, best. If you look into these operational tips, um, how to make posts good, but that doesn't mean necessarily that your community and following is gonna grow or the trust in what you're saying necessarily is gonna grow. So it's really important to first start, who is your audience? Who do you want to talk to? Are these your patients? Are these your friends, family, uh, in your hometown or in the community where you live now? Or are these your other fellow nurses from around the world who are actually the people you're going to talk to? And then what is really your added value? Why someone should follow and listen to you? Um, and again, this is not to really, this is not to discourage you of being, oh, I don't have anything to say. I think that all of you have a lot to say. It is really just finding and defining your voice um, in, in, in the right way. And when you define these two, uh, then what really matters is in, in growing the trust and your community in the first place is really authenticity, um, sharing the real you, uh, not trying to be someone else. This works for Aisha, this works for Alex, this works for Dr. Tedros. Yes, we can all be food for thought to each other and learn from each other, but what is the real you that you care about? What is your story? What is your tone as well? How do you, you communicate? Um, sharing some of your personal experiences, um, et cetera. So it's really important to build an authentic voice. Again, just to give you an example as well, how I work with Dr. Tedros, as I'm supporting him and helping him with his social media posts, I'm traveling a lot with him. I'm sitting in his meeting. So I've had the opportunity to really absorb the real him his tone, his voice, his vocabulary. And this is why as well, our partnership is working well. He understood the importance of that. Um, we do have a lot of other leaders where their advisors are using the generic talking points and this is not really having, having a success. So showing the real you, it's, it's really important. Um, it's also important to be consistent. Um, algorithms at the end of the day are machines and if you're regular, then they also see the signal that you're there, you're contributing. So you, they are also pushing you more. Uh, posting once in a blue moon is not going to help. So, and it's hard. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling myself to be consistent and regular on my LinkedIn profile um, because of all the other work um, uh, commitments that I have. And also as I'm contributing my ideas to work, it's hard then to have ideas as well for yourself. But it is important if you want your voice to really have an impact and to be trusted, to be consistent. Um, it's also important to be relevant. Is this really uh, something that my community cares about? Uh, Aisha shared to me, yes, we do care about your insight on communication from the meetings where you are. So this, I'm getting some positive feedback here, um, but it may not be the same level of feedback on every activity. So it is also important to analyze and listen to the feedback and needs of your community so that the content you are providing them resonates uh, with them. It's also important to be timely. And if I'm very honest, for example, the post that I shared on LinkedIn last night about this workshop, I should have shared it earlier. It would give more time to people to see it, to register, to apply, or for my community to share it with nurses they know. However, the, the world has been busy and my brain hasn't been fresh as I traveled a lot. So it took me some time really to develop my post because, again, I don't want to have a post that is there just for the sake of posting it, I want my community to, I'm not in the community of nurses necessarily. So I want my community to understand why actually talking about social media use with nursing community matters from the communications perspective. And last but not least, engage. Social media is about socializing. It's about connecting people. So broadcasting is, you know, for media outlets, um, and uh, for some traditional media um, channels, but social media is really about engagement. So one is to really reply 
to the comments that you're receiving, to the people who are actually following, but also commenting on their posts and creating opportunities for conversation. This is really key to build the trust uh, more than just broadcasting your, your own content. And if you don't have ideas how to fill in your page with your own content, then scroll and find what do you really resonate with and, and engage with those people. And maybe last but not least, some tips on then how to respond to mis and disinformation. I would say the first step is when we see something that's shocking and we know for sure it's not true or we doubt if it's true, first would be to check the fact behind it. Um, but then if you feel like I wanna say something about this because it's gonna harm people in my community is to assess whether a response would make a difference. Then also, who your response would be useful to. Um, is this my, this is actually dangerous for my friends, my family, or it's actually dangerous for my colleagues. And again, with social media, you can have different communities on different platforms. For example, on my Facebook, I communicate with my friends and family back home in Serbia. On LinkedIn, it's more my professional peers. So I will, I will share a different message to different communities. Then pick an appropriate channel to reach those people um, and as well form. So sometimes you will want to create your own post that talk about why the pandemic accord, for example, is needed because you want your fellow nurses to be better protected next time, that nurses everywhere have enough personal protective equipment, that they have vaccines first, et cetera. Um, maybe actually someone is sharing some crazy information and you want their followers to understand that this is a nonsense. So maybe you will reply to that person and say, FYI, this is inaccurate. Here's where you can find information or I can tell you firsthand from the experience why this is not true. I'm just making up here examples to give you some food for thought. It's really important not to repeat the rumor. There's a lot of evidence from social science that Repeating the rumor gives it another uh, momentum to be repeated and to spread further. And it's really important to actually have simple response that would resonate to people. Among the UN, we see a lot of, and sometimes we are also limited as UN um, staff on how we can respond and that we have to use the policy UN language, but you have way more freedom to be blunt and to be direct and, and simplify things for, for your communities. I'm going to share a few examples here. Uh, so we produce quite a lot of content using Dr. Tedros' voice in debunking some of the, the disinformation. This was a video and it was a short one minute video. We haven't repeated the, the, the disinformation and we're focusing on facts, but it's not always that these people care about facts. Once you post the fact, they come with their fact. Um, and this is actually also a challenge, but this is why we have different voices and different uh, accounts uh, communicating in different ways. Um, one of our consultants and colleague who has produced a lot of our videos, he is also a doctor. So he has been using a lot of his voice to debunk different, uh, or to clarify, provide evidence for, for different information. This, this was about what WHO has done so far to prepare for pandemics better. Um, recent development in the UK, our communication director did not take a direct response uh, to some of the, the, to the news outlet or to individuals who actually share this information, but she used her voice to clarify as she has a lot of media uh, following her. So this message was, was for them. Someone you know well, speaking about the, 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 the suffering of health workers uh, during the pandemic and why the instrument is needed. Or one of my colleagues who has been replying a lot with fact checker, fact checker content to many of those um, who are sharing in, in inaccurate uh, coverage and information. At the end of the day, we, we shared this last time that it's not a matter of what is true that counts, but a matter of what is perceived to be true. And this is challenging and dangerous, but this is where we need really all hands and voices on deck 
um, to actually drive the, the, the factual narrative that would help us to collectively ultimately save, save lives. I think I'm going to pause here to see if we have some questions before um, we move into the, the group work. Yeah, but have we have we got any questions? Um, remember, no question is a silly question because other people might have been thinking about it. And I've learned so much just in all of these slides. I have to say I was holding my head in my hands because I thought all the things you said don't do, I do. <laughs> so I've learned lots of great tips. But has anyone else there got a question? If you can um, pop your hand up or just... Uh, just give us a, a wave, um, that would be great. Or if there's maybe any in the chat, I can't actually see. Um, oh, here we go, yeah, I, I can see. Um, I'm gonna just have a look through the messages if there's any in the, um, there's a comment. I feel like there is misinformation, disinformation with regards to the global shortage of nurses and midwives because in low and middle income countries, we have a lot of unemployed nurses um, and midwives. I would like the world to know that low and middle income countries registered nurses and midwives are not employed in the health system. And I'm aware of that, actually. So that's another issue around misinformation and disinformation. Um, Jean-Paul, for several years, I've been carrying out research into preconceived ideas and false beliefs about HIV AIDS and other pandemics such as COVID. I'm making efforts to raise awareness among young people through Facebook and WhatsApp. Need collaboration and support to improve this work. Oh, well, hopefully you've heard lots of information there um, with this if you've got a question. Um, Zippy has put, thanks, Alex, gained a lot of insight on social media use. Okay, we, so no questions at the minute, Alex, but maybe so any, we, any we have one hand up. Oh, lovely. Great. Perfect. Who has got their hand up? Hello, that's me, Angelique. Oh, hi, Angelique. Hi. Good morning, everybody. It's very, uh, very early, bright and actually dark and early here in New York. Um, okay. Okay. Happy to, to be here. introduce yourself, Anjali. Obviously, we know each other very well, um, but we great to hear your question for Alex. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anjali. Um, I'm a registered nurse from the US. I'm currently based in the Midwest, but I'm hoping to get out to New York here visiting right now. Um, but uh, yeah, my the history of being a registered nurse in cardiothoracic surgery step down unit in California. Um, I've experienced volunteering abroad as a, as a nurse as well. Um, and I recently completed my master's in advanced nursing with Aisha over at the University of Edinburgh. Um, but yeah, my question is, I, first of all, thank you Alex for this great presentation. Um, it was really, really informative. I, I, I'm kind of grabbing onto the word pre-bunking here. Um, I never heard that word before. Um, and I guess this one asked me if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And that, is that basically just the process of, like you said, kind of biting that head off the rumor before it really grows? Um, and then also, as far as timeliness, um, I know you mentioned it in posting about certain events. But is there any certain timing for posting certain times of the day? I, I sometimes I'm, I'm wary of that um, and try to think about where most of my network is located. I'll try to post more strategically, timing wise, but do you have any tips about that as well to kind of increase engagement? Thank you very much. These are great questions and I saw some new in, in the chat, so I'll take those as well. Um, so in terms of pre-bunking, um, Last week, um, I was in a conference that the EU uh, presidency by Belgium uh, was organized on crisis communication. There was someone from Google who was talking about their effort on pre-banking. And I think we can perceive pre-banking in different ways from a tech company perspective and then us as individuals. What they are doing when they anticipate based on all their data um, analytics is actually to expose people to potential misinformation and warn them that they may see more content like that, which is not correct. We don't have the capacity or like ways to do that as WHO or as Alex or Angelique or Aisha. Where I think that as a health community, we can work on in a way as a pre-banking ease in improving the um, 
quantity and quality of health content before the storms hit. So we've seen in COVID that a lot of uh, health institutions created accounts in lockdowns and started bombarding people with information what they must do. And then that dropped because there was no resources for a regular um, content creation and maintaining that presence. So in my view and from my observations during the COVID and other outbreaks, actually we need to have presence now and regularly communicate with people about health risks so that when something worse happens, or to say, this is the place where they come uh, for an advice, not just in a moment of, of panic. And in that sense, is what, having presence is not, again, just putting the information out. One important thing I missed to say that we in our team say that social media is 99% listening. So we are using social media to see what people are saying, what are their concerns? What are the health-related conversations? What they are saying about WHO? What, what are the misinformation or rumors spreading? And then we take that, we do that on a daily basis and we make our assessment how we, if and how we will respond to that. Um, and in that sense as well, for individuals, you know, social media is an important um, tool for you to see what is happening, what, what are people's concerns, and then whether, I, from my perspective, experience, um, can add something to help people clarify that. Or if I'm building my presence slowly with the community where I serve, for example, as a nurse, when there is something bad happening, then my patient's going to trust and come to me and ask me whether they should get a vaccine or not, rather than being an expert from whatever they are seeing on the internet from someone who is not a health a health professional. So it does take time. The best time to start is now. Um, and also uh, social media changes uh, and your voice will be adapting to the new evolution of tools, trends, uh, people's needs, but still at the core is really slowly step-by-step step building that base. One of the, some of the tactics I shared as well in terms of engaging with people, because I saw the content uh, comment here as well. Uh, if you have a small following, what can you do to build credibility? Again, I think it's not all about size. You know, and yes, I'm talking as someone who has been behind the big accounts, but actually at the community level, a small account that is engaging and that people are actually giving positive feedback or coming back to here is maybe more impactful in that community than a WHO nursing now or any big, uh, big account. So I think when it comes to health information, the, if there is an impact on one person and how they, they, that person will be making their health decision, that's one life saved potentially, uh, rather than necessarily just having a big engagement numbers. And I want to also address the question about the timing. That is really individual from account to account. It depends as well on how the algorithm on the platform works. Uh, one important aspect for that is regularity. And you can also test you know, be posting in different times of the day and see if you have some of the apps like Instagram gives you, for example, when is the, when do you have most engagement when you post in what time of the day? I have a friend here who noticed that Tuesday mornings is when it works for her account. Um, I've noticed if I post very late at night, European time, I have less engagement than posting in the morning. So it really depends, I think, on where you're based, who's who your followers are and can be tested and assessed to find your optimal way um, to, to do it. I hope this, this helps. And thanks to those who have joined us now. Lovely. Thank you so much, Anjali. Really, really useful um, questions. We have, um, and hopefully that very um, thorough um, uh, response from, from us. And I think your questions just show how much we work we need to do within our profession to become really, um, I don't know what the word is, not expert, we use that word a lot, but you know, we're competent in this and we can work together. So um, Zipporah, um, who's in Africa, she has asked the question, if you have a small following, or maybe actually Zipporah, can you come on and ask it yourself? Cause I know you're there. She's still with us. 
Yes, hi. <laughs> so I had someone at my door. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it's good to see you, Aisha. It's good to see you, Alex. And Angelique, I haven't seen her in a minute. Um, yeah, so there's this notion that if you have a small following, then people don't really listen to what you have to say. So I'm just curious to know how you can build credibility, how you can increase the reach of your voice even when you have a small following. And also, just to add on Angelique's question, um, I see a lot of advisors on social media uh, where they share that you have to post at least thrice a week um, and at least like on Instagram, Facebook, like put your stories like three times a week as well to grow um, your following and whatnot. I would love to hear what your ideas are on how to grow our pages and how to increase our reach. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to hear from you again. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I don't really have a, a secret formula. Um, the truth is that yes, especially if you're a new account, you need to be posting as often as possible uh, so that actually people can notice you and that algorithm can notice you and then promote your content more. Um, some of the tactics that I shared is engaging with others, replying to their posts so that they can notice you. And I spoke to someone last night who actually doesn't have a big following on threads, but even when he replies to big accounts like state department or something like that, they were replying to him on threads. So you can also test on different platforms or this is just example from one of the newer platforms that even the big accounts are replying uh, more. The other is as well, use your offline network. Hey, I have a new account here. Can you please give it a like? Can you please follow it? Um, hey, my friends, uh, I've done this video. Can you please have a look? I would welcome your feedback. So I think in the at the beginning, we need to use all the tools at disposal, not just to have faith that the algorithm is going to do everything for us. Um, so think about your dis dissemination strategies online and offline as well. And even as your present grows, you know, there are always people who, you know, maybe your friend, but not interested in the same subject, but maybe they can have a useful feedback because they have, you know, good presentation skills or something that they would come back to you. Oh, next time, maybe you can improve this or that. So, that would be my advice um, and also to be to be patient because uh, it does take time and uh, the presence cannot be built a built overnight. And again, last but not least, think about collaborations and partnerships among your network um, and that can help as well. In terms of joint collaborative posts, that's what I meant. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Zippy. Um, and we have a couple of comments in the text. And um, Siobhan, would you like to, we'll probably make this the last question because I know we've got to keep on to time for the, um, or maybe we'll take two, there's a couple of hands up actually. Um, so Siobhan has one question in there, but um, and I, I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly and apologies if I'm not. Um, all who Bun me. All about me? Yeah, I was thinking you would murder my name, but I think you're doing great. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Please tell me, how do you <laughs> say it? How, tell, tell us how you say it. Okay, Olubumi, but Bumi for short. Olubumi. Olubumi, but Bumi for short. Yes. Okay, yes, okay, Olubumi. Absolutely. Over to you. Yeah. And then we'll yeah. do Siobhan, <laughs> and then we'll move on to our... our breakout groups. Thank you so much, Olubumi. Thank you so much for this section. I'm sorry I joined late uh, no because uh, right now Nigeria is working on our glo our Nigeria um, uh, direction for strategic direction for nursing and middle free. It's an amazing time for us. It's Fantastic. critical. Good to hear yes. that. Yes, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I'm sure uh, for those of us that will be coming to the World Health Assembly in a couple of weeks, we, we can probably also try to network during that section. I mean, you know, we have different sections. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I'll <laughs> be there. We'll meet each other and we'll hopefully meet oh. Alex. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, yes. So I will just drop my email, please, so that I can track you when I'm yes. arriving on 22 by God's grace. 
Yes, so me too. Will, Good. Yeah. Okay. So I will say that I just want to say that in Africa, I'm from Nigeria. I based in Abuja. The, the nurses in Africa are played down on the social media. And there's no solidarity spirit among us. I have been a nurse more than two decades and I stand to be corrected. But I noticed that, but what I do, if I see a post by nurses or group of nurses, for instance, I, I will read it because it's always good to read the content. And once it's good, I've reposted it. So by way of solidarity, supporting each other, that is what I do. I actually don't need to know you. I don't need to know where you are coming from. So the question is, how do we promote solidarity among nurses on the social media? Number one. And number two, how do we encourage, like for instance, Nigerian nurses to really see social media as a very important tool to communicate our our what we do and also to share some of our concern. Recently, the the DGWHO from Afro visited Nigeria and they are talking about eradication of malaria through vaccination. Again, nurses are not on the table. Nurses were not invited across the sections. And when I saw it on Twitter, I was really back to back. I know they can hear me even when they are not replying, but I know I've made my point. How can you talk about eradicating malaria in Afro region? How do you talk about immunization or vaccination without engaging nurses, without having them on the table? Anyway, how do we improve that? How do we encourage our nurses? We all, we all have, almost everybody have a smartphone, but how do we really engage? Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to see you soon. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, really well made points there, a frustration that we all feel. Um, and some of that is about our profession ourselves. But there is maybe an element in there, Alex, that is relevant around how we support each other. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you, Bumi, for, for, for the question and sharing the frustration. This is a safe space, I would, I would like to say. Um, I, I think the fact that you're raising your voice is the first step. And I do hope that more of your colleagues will follow your example. Um, in terms of uh, mobilization of nurses, for me, this is one of the ways. This is why exactly I am part of this workshop so that I can help sharing my skills with you that hopefully this can help you in, in, in communicating what your uh, needs uh, and beliefs are for your profession and for the patients that you um, that you serve, and I I would be happy to participate again. And uh, as time is you know passing and changing, I'm happy to be part of the conversation. I think this is what is in my domain and how I can help. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much. And yes, Bunmi, you can share this. Um, this is recorded, so you can share that with your colleagues. I think, you know, with everything, with big changes, and this is a big change for the nursing profession and midwifery profession, but we are starting to see that change. And remember, the WHO itself and the DG were really influential, along with Lord Crisp, Nigel, and um, Jim. Campbell in really um, pushing forward the Nursing Now campaign, the CNO at the WHO, um, the DG is a huge supporter of workforce, so and, and nurses particularly, and midwives and all health workers. So we have allies, we need to work together. The Nursing Now Challenge is a perfect place for people to join. Please get your colleagues to join. The more of us that we are together, we can support each other and we get that support from each other and encourage each other. Um, so we are with you. We are with you. All of us across the world who are on this call now are supporting you. Um, and we can make a change by, by coming together. But thank you so much. Very inspirational and uplifting. I can feel your passion. It's great. Um, and then we have um, Siobhan. Um, Siobhan, I don't, do you want to just um, bring your question to Alex? So I yes, see the yes, question. Um, thank you. Oh. oh, you can see it. Okay. I'll just introduce myself, Alex, if that's okay. I'm Siobhan Zagievsky. I work in Leeds, West Yorkshire. 
and I'm a dual trained nurse. I've been a nurse for 37 years. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working in many different environments and different areas and recently worked with NHS England recruiting international nurses. So I just want to give one point to the previous speaker in that our international nursing community, of which we have quite a few Nigerian nurses, are very active on social media in the UK as a, as a sort of group, which is incredible because that's how we, well, that's how we get a lot of messages shared out to them in the, in the in nationally. So it's just an interesting um spin on that, that when we have uh, uh, nurses coming into country to support our, uh, uh, you know, health service, um, we are seeing really, we're seeing them very active in, 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 on social media in terms of, and, and electronically, they communicate much better electronically than, than our internet pages and things in the organisations. So, um, but uh, really powerful words from, from uh, Bumi earlier. Yeah, I just have two questions, Alex. Uh, you can see there, what's considered a small following and what has the most impact, tagging or a hashtag? Thank you. Nice to meet you. My husband is from a village around Leeds and a huge Leeds United fan, so I'm glad to meet you. In terms of the questions, I mean, the size whether it's small or big following, it's relevant, right? Uh, for someone, even 2 million following is small, for example, if you have, if you compare it to 50, 60 million. And it can, it, it can be a thousand, it can be 10 followers, but it, it really depends on the way the account is used and the way that content is engaged, uh, engaged with. Uh, and actually, who is your audience? Is your audience the whole world? or your audience is really the small community that you are serving serving in. So I, again, there's no like key for, formula. It really depends on the context and what do you want to, to achieve. In terms of uh, impact of tagging or hashtag, I, I, the purpose is a little bit different. Um, the hashtag is more uh, search uh, term and engine for a topic. So for example, you are interested what people are saying about climate change. So you put the climate change, you can see the latest, you can see the most, the top ones, you can see the best videos, etc. So for example, if you use key or generic terms, like as I use climate change, then there's a lot of variations. Climate change for health, climate change for kids, climate change for animals, I'm making up here. Truly, if you go and search for climate change content, you're just going to put climate change. You're rarely going to put climate change for kids. I'm just making up again. So when you are thinking about what are the hashtags you want to use, think about how people are actually, what is the purpose and what is it helping? How, how it's going to help your post to be more discovered. Um, when it comes to tagging, it is your attempt to to alert individuals or organizations about your post. And probably you consider that this is relevant for them, that they should do some further, further action. So it depends again, what do you what do you want to achieve and who do you want to want to trigger with your post? Thank you. That, oh, yes. that's, that's good. Um, thank, you. thank you. That's a really good answer. And it's just simplified it for me. And yeah, it's thank not about you. the number. It's about who your audience is. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're all learning. We're all learning. And okay. again, sorry. if you look, sorry, just last thing. If you look into the numbers, engagement is more important than the following. Because if your account is not closed and it's public, if your content is good, even your small community of followers, if they amplify it, it can go wider. So it really comes back that the content is king or queen, how do you want to call it? Uh, that, that That is a key for, for your success. I, I think we are That's running out of we're time. time. Yes, yes. So we're going to move now. Thank you so much, everybody, for those chats and the, the questions. So um, Hannah and Fair, who are behind the scenes, master planning all of this, um, we're going to get some um, movement into the breakout rooms. So there will be four rooms of about four to five people in each, and you will automatically be moved into your breakout rooms. Um, and the task is here, which I think Alex might just run through. Yes, thank you so much, Aisha. So here is the screenshot of two very recent comments about the pandemic accord. These are repetitive disinformation around it. 
The first one is that WHO is going to take over national sovereignty and therefore be empowered to mandate vaccines, lockdowns, and other policies once the next pandemic happens. This is a false narrative. And we would like you to think about how you as nurses in different locations, so you as a group will work on a draft post to communicate, uh, to debunk this in your own voice or way of doing it. And you should pick where you are based. Are you based in the UK, Papua New Guinea, Nigeria? So you as a group, pick the location of your service and create a post that would be debunking this um, from, um, from, from, from your point of view in the place where you are. Ideally, you could explain to us how you would do it, what would be your tactics, but 15 minutes may be too short. So think about you're a nurse, pick the place and what would be your response. And hopefully then in 15 minutes time, we at least can hear one or two examples and have a little discussion about it with the time that's left.